Good morning to everyone. I'm going to speak about corneal presbyopia correction. These are my financial disclosures. So presbyopia is the most prevalent visual condition in adulthood. You can see in these two graphs what is the estimation for the progression in presbyopia the next year. And it will go increasing up to 2030. And curiously, from there on, there will be a decrease. And you can guess this is from the incorporation of the myopics of this uh, epidemi epidemic of these years, that later on when they become, they will not be uh, functional presbyops. And the point is that this uh, condition has a significant impact in quality of life. If you check bibliography, you will find, for example, that it's supposed to be equivalent to illnesses such as uh, hypertension. And, and I have both of them, and I tell you that presbyopia is much worse than that, than hypertension. So, and right now, and this is why we are here today, it is the main reason to seek refractive surgery at present day. So this is the main reason why patients are coming for refractive surgery. 20, 30 years ago, it was myopia from the baby boomers. Now the same baby boomers are going presbyopic and they are seeking refractive surgery. So there have been many, many uh, surgical techniques in the past and now in the present and of course in the future to, to address this issue. And now in this talk, I'm going to focus on presbylasic. So presbylasic, can be defined as the LASIK technique that applies a multifocal or read-off profile to the cornea in order to achieve an increased depth of field. It comes from long ago. So first papers proposing a multifocal are from the first in, uh, 90s, the first in 1992, and the term was coined by Louis Reith, Colombia, in 1996. And it's the, the attractiveness of this technique is that it's, it's got many advantages over multifocal IOLs. First, conceptually, it's a not intraocular technique. Safety profile is much better. It's a quick surgery under topical anesthesia, quick recovery, millions of LASIK over the world in the last 35 years. So everybody knows LASIK out there in the street, so it's got a very good spread of uh, word of mouth. And very importantly, it preserves the lens for future surgeries. And we all know that present-day IOLs are not perfect. They are far from perfect. So it's not a bad idea doing something on the cornea and waiting for technological evolution for the future. So there are two main strategies. One is what's called the central presbylasic, where we add more power to the central cornea. And of course, this will be the area used for near vision. And in counterpart, it's the peripheral presbylasic. We do the opposite. We give more power in an annular area in the mid-periphery, so that will be the part for neovision. Central presbylasic seems to be better. And the main reason is that there is a synergy, synergical effect with near meiosis. So central corneal higher power plus its induced spherical aberration plus the small aperture, they are all playing in favor of a good near vision. So this is why, generally speaking, central presbylasic is better than peripheral. Beyond that, spherical aberration is an easily processed aberration by the brain because we know that this is a natural aberration in our eyes. So there is a facility for our brain to adapt to that. Less tissue ablation, and it's easier to revert. So years ago, I started playing in my LASIK with just adding a C12 uh, a spherical aberration profile so we could correct same myopias, but adding more spherical aberration correction, we induced this central at power. And we learned that we could increase the depth of field, so this was effective to provide some near vision but there was a balance because there was a decrease of visual equality, particularly in big pupils. There was myopization in small pupils. And going, uh, passing some threshold, uh, we decreased the best corrected visual acuity. So we had to look for what, how far could we go increasing that central power, increasing that spherical aberration, not impairing the situation. And we have learned, and this is gener general in, in most papers, that over 1.5 to 2 diopters of depth of focus increase 
visual quality impairs and therefore best corrected visual acuity decreases. So you can extend the depth of focus up to a certain limit. And this is why all the platforms have arrived at the same conclusion. We have to use micro monovision to add something to, to the eye playing more in near so that this addition of refraction plus the spherical aberration will achieve a functional near vision. Very important, there is pupil dependency. So all rotationally symmetrical multifocal or edof profiles are pupil dependent, particularly the central profiles. If the pupil gets very small, refraction turns myopic. In huge pupils, there will be an aberration of refractions of the other, uh, near and distance part, but there will be, of course, worse visual quality. So the best uh, are the middle-sized pupils. Photopic, something between three, four millimeters. Scotopic, something between four, six millimeters. And we love the fast reacting pupils. So pupil dynamics should be studied as well because those patients get adapted quicker. So as you can imagine, pupillometry is essential in the pre-op study. And two tips for the patients, they, they should be advised to read with good illumination. This improves results. Seems quite stupid and obvious, but this is a very valuable advice for them. And use sunglasses in outdoors, because uh, with this you will increase a little bit the pupil diameter, so refraction is not that myopic. So this is the sweet zone. This is what we want uh, when we are watching the pupillometry pre-op for photopic and for scotopic pupils. So taking a look at what we have available right now, We've got the Presby Max by Schwind. I, I will talk about the three most popular platforms. The Presby Max by Schwind, it's a biospheric multifocal ablation profile. So each concentric area is multifocal with a smooth transition to provide some intermediate vision. Uh, near vision and the pericentral cornea for DSBs. All, all right. And um, um, so it's using the micro monovision refraction, using the non-dominant eye target of 0.87. That will be the near eye. And the dominant eye will be focused in distance. So there are three different strategies to get some depth of focus. Monocular, so depth of focus is increased only in the near eye. You can imagine this will be for patients that prefer to preserve distance vision, put there their priority. Uh, something intermediate is called hybrid, depth of focus increased in both eyes, and micromonovision where depth of focus is increased 100% in both eyes. So you can see, for example, in this, in this uh, figure, for a selected ad of 1.75, the near eye, the non-dominant eye, will always have the same correction. So we target distance with some myopia, 0.87, and then we give that ad to reach that 175. And the difference comes in the distance side, where in, in the lower row, in the monocular strategy, we don't add anything. So that eye will be corrected just for distance. In the upper row, that will be the, 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 more, the strongest uh, addition. Um, so here we are adding uh, that depth of focus of 0.87. And in the middle, in the hybrid, will be something in between. This is one strategy with what we call the low add, 175. But we can add more following the same strategy. Near eye, non-dominant, just distance vision uh, will be with that myopia, and then we put the addition for near. And the same three options for the uh, dominant eye regarding if the priority is distance vision or near vision. So we can see that way. In the lower row, you can see the monocular. In this case, uh, the dominant eye will be only for distance. In the middle, the hybrid. Here, the dominant eye will have some focus up to intermediate distance. And in the upper part, the dominant eye will have focus since distance, since infinity, up to nearly one meter. So of course, playing with the other eye, this will provide a very good near vision. And in small pupils, Presby Max can be still done. I told you that with small pupils, 
you might not consider doing these techniques because of some drawbacks. But in small pupils, Presbymax mono monocular, if you think about that, it works just as classic monovision. So another good point of Presbymax is that there is reversal. You can apply a software called Presbymax reversal. So if the patient is not happy, we have to give six months for corneal remodeling and giving time to neuroadaptation. But finally, if for any reason you want to revert that, you can do it. There is a software, and normally you can see here, you will get quite a very similar topography and a very similar aberration uh, profile to pre-op condition. So just bring your focus into the range of treatments possible. We go from minus eight to plus five, so we can use Presbymax with any refractive correction. And there are certain limits for a visual quality and above those thresholds, it's better not to go with this because of course we will increase significantly the level of uh, aberrations. Well, this is a decision tree, I will skip it. And I will focus now on Supracore by uh, Bausch & Lomb with a Tineo laser, which is a multifocal laser profile that creates a more powerful central three millimeter zone with a smooth transition. So it's doing something really similar to the Presbymax with three addition levels, what they call mild, regular, and strong. So this is a topography. And in hyperopia, we are steepening the central cornea and steepening even more the very central three millimeters that will be the add part for near. So this is the distribution of distances. And in myopia, we flatten the whole cornea, but we steepen the central part to provide that addition again getting these uh, focus distances. So we can use Supracore as well since minus five to plus three. So we can use it nearly for most of refractions. And similarly to Presbymax, you can play depending on the priorities of the patient. In these techniques, it's very, very important to ask the patient what he wants and discuss with him uh, the balance between achieving a very good near vision and sacrificing some distance vision. Supracore has an advisor ad for the mobile, uh, both for iPhone and, and Android. And then we arrive at the last, which is Presbyond. And, and Dan, if I screw up, please tell me. Uh, laser profile here targets a certain amount of spherical aberration, so it's a, a slightly different thing. We are not necessarily increasing the central power, but we are targeting a certain amount of spherical aberration to increase the depth of field. So the profile will vary as a function of refraction, spherical aberration, and optical zone. And again, we are targeting micromonovision. Some myopia will be targeted in the non-dominant eye. So the point is that uh, spherical aberration increases the depth of focus. And this occurs at both sides of zero. So it's quite the same for negative and for positive. I have to say that negative spherical aberration is working synerg synergically with any residual accommodation that, of course, is working in the, in the early 50s or late 40s, and plus the meiosis. So the level of spherical aberration to reach some near vision will be lower in the negative part. So how does Presbyon play? It's putting that threshold of 0.56 microns for six millimeters. That's the acceptable spherical aberration. So if a myopia is corrected and you are uh, driving the spherical aberration to the positive side, probably Presbyon will do nothing or a very small correction because naturally this refraction correction will produce a spherical aberration up to that number. If it's a higher myopia, then Presbyon will drive down, will correct some of that spherical aberration until an acceptable number. And if the, the eye had previous high spherical aberration, so we end in a very high number, again, Presbyon is bringing it down. In hyperopia, it's quite the opposite. But here, we are moving to negative spherical aberration. So Presbyon will increase the negative spherical aberration making that central cornea, the cornea more prolate. And if it's high hyperopia, uh, probably the presbyon will do nothing because naturally the correction of a high level hyperopia will induce enough spherical aberration to, to be in the, in, the, in the sweet zone. 
So finally, dominant eyes targeted to Plano, non-dominant to minus 1.5, and both eyes are treated to reach that amount of spherical aberration that will provide the increased depth of field. And the intermediate distance is what they call the blend zone, because here image fusion occurs, opposite to monovision, where precisely at that part, normally there is some suppression. So going to the outcomes, I will skip all the revision. <laughs> just, just this. All right, we have to cut down. So just call your attention that distance vision normally will be binocular. Distance vision will be between 70 to 80, uh, 100%. And here, press beyond going to bibliography works a little better. Near vision, J2 or better, will be normally between 80 to 90 something percent, so normally good vision. And there is some loss of uh, lines. So and this can be the problem with the central power corrections where, where normally there is a loss. It's, not, it's quite frequent, something between 5 to 20%, one line and sometimes two lines. While Presbyon apparently is safer because it's losing one line in a lower frequency and regularly you find no two lines lost. So I will skip this. Just to tell the long-term long -term outcomes, uh, all the questionnaires are showing that the quality of vision and the near vision tasks are in a level comparable to pre-op situation. And normally, uh, quality of vision has improved through the years. So I will skip this for lack of time. And the conclusions, this is an interesting option to correct ametropia and presbyopia in the 40, 60 range of years. Uh, corneal central increased power and or spherical aberration modulation allows increased depth of field. The most frequent strategy is micromonovision, dominant eye for, for far and non-dominant for near. There are some differences among different platforms and there is a learning curve in the outcomes. We didn't have time to see that. Results are much better now than they were 10 years ago. There is some regression of the near effect through time, and this must be explained to the patient. And post-op surveys show a high degree of satisfaction with the outcome. So thank you very much.